So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Alan Packwood, and I'm lucky enough to be the director of the Archive Centre. Churchill College is delighted to be hosting this talk this evening on Churchill and nuclear weapons. And the college is undoubtedly an extremely appropriate venue for such a talk, not least because our first master, Sir John Cockcroft, was very much part of the story that you're about to hear. And of course, the Churchill Archive Centre has many of the relevant papers, which have been heavily mined by our two speakers tonight, Graham and Kevin, who've established themselves as the experts on this subject. And some of these papers you can actually see in our exhibition in the Wolfson Foyer area outside, which is also where you can buy copies of Kevin and Graham's books. Um, and after um, the talk and after discussion, um, we're going to ask Kevin and Graham to stay on the stage so that any of you who want to bring books up for them to sign can do so at that point. Um, just a, a few housekeeping notices from me. We're not planning any fire alarms, any nuclear alerts um, this evening. So if the alarms sound, um, please take directions from the member of staff, go out of the fire exits, and we'll assemble by the Hepworth sculpture. Um, we are filming proceedings um, tonight, and um, the film will be going up on the college website. Um, so that means that if you don't want to be filmed, make sure you're sitting at the back of the hall. And it means that if you want to be on the film and you want to ask a question, um, make sure that you wait for the microphone to come to you and perhaps give your name um, um, before you ask your question. Um, now, normally at this point, we ask people to turn their phones off. We're not going to do that tonight. We're going to ask you to turn your phones to silent. But for those of you um, who are tweeters, um, we're going to encourage you to tweet and tweet using the hashtag that you can see up there, Churchill Goes Nuclear. Um, I want to thank... Shelley Surtees and her team, and the two Chrises in the audiovisual booth, the Archive Centre team, um, and everyone who's been involved in staging this event tonight. And if you enjoy this symposium, um, there is another next week um, on Tuesday and Wednesday on What is War Today? On Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, you can get details from the, um, from the college website um, when we have Malcolm Rifkind, Lord Ashdown, various generals, admirals, air marshals um, um, coming to speak. So do come back for that. Um, but it's my pleasure tonight to hand over to Helen Curry, recently promoted to senior lecturer in the history of modern science and technology. Um, a specialist in the history of biology, biotechnology, agriculture, environmentalism, and global environmental history. Um, she's a fellow of the college, a member of the Archives Committee, and tonight we've persuaded her to take on both physics and politics. Helen. Thanks very much. Um, good evening, everyone, and, and let me second Alan's warm welcome to you here tonight. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be able to serve as a moderator for a conversation between Graham Farmello, author of Churchill's Bomb, and Kevin Ran, author of Churchill and the Bomb in War and Cold War. Uh, you have, hopefully, their biographies in front of you, um, which you brought in from outside. Um, and as you'll know from that, these are two formidable experts on tonight's topic, which is Winston Churchill and the history of nuclear weapons. They are experts who, in their recent books, in fact, take quite different approaches to this same subject. And through tonight's conversation, we'll be privileged to learn from them the ways in which their, their accounts both complement, but also at times challenge one another on this history. There are a number of different events that one might start with in recounting Churchill's long engagement with nuclear weapons. An engagement that, as we will discuss, no doubt, cycled between half-hearted and all-consuming, short-sighted and visionary, prescient and just plain bullheaded. But tonight, what I'm going to do to introduce us to this story, I'll start off with an event of March 1940. This was just two months before Winston Churchill assumed the premiership for the first time. Two emigre physicists, who you see on the screen here, then resident in Britain, Otto Frisch and Rudolf Perels, drew up a memo in which they communicated the outcomes of some of their recent calculations. 
Although physicists had for some years debated the possibility that a controlled nuclear chain reaction in uranium could be used to create a super bomb, most of them agreed that there were just too many technical constraints to this ever happening. But the short, punchy memo that uh, Frisch and Perels drew up cut through earlier objections and demonstrated that a super bomb could in fact be built and that it need only weigh even as much as a pound. The Frisch Perel's memo, which was circulated to members of a British uh, defense committee, precipitated what would soon be known as the Maud Committee. The Maud Committee, in turn, was tasked with further investigating the feasibility of this proposed uranium superbomb. The eventual report of the Maud Committee, circulated in July 1941, spelled out that the bomb was feasible. It estimated that it could be made in two years, and it urged that the British government move to inaugurate a weapons program to create this bomb, not least because it seemed possible that scientists in Nazi Germany might already have done so. Churchill, with persuading from his close friend and chief advisor in matters scientific, the physicist Frederick Lindemann, followed the recommendations of the Maud Committee report. The British bomb effort, codenamed Tube Alloys, a suitably boring uh, term, was launched in late summer 1941 under Churchill's watch. Lindemann was instrumental in getting his friend Churchill to sign off on the bomb. He was equally influential in persuading Churchill in those early days that it ought to be a British project. There had been significant communication among American and British scientists engaged up to that time in research on the bomb, with many Brits imploring greater integration in order to take advantage of US resources and vice versa. Despite this, Churchill soft-pedaled an initial offer of full cooperation that was put forward by US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in October of 1941. Was this dismissal uh, by Churchill of FDR's offer a mistake. Most historians looking back have judged it to be so. The United States program zoomed ahead and tube alloys lagged, and there was never another opportunity for Britain to join with the United States as an equal partner in atomic development. When Churchill met Roosevelt in Quebec, Canada in August 1943 for a secret military conference, he was keen to obtain assurance of full interchange of nuclear information. This followed on two very frustrating years of Americans promising but then withholding uh, information from British scientists. Churchill did obtain in Quebec a promise of full exchange and even a proviso uh, that British consent would be sought before an atomic weapon was used. But this came at the price of forfeiting British rights to independently develop nuclear energy for commercial or industrial ends after the war. Clearly, at this point, Americans had the upper hand in negotiation. The Quebec Agreement was a private agreement not ratified by Congress or, or brought before Parliament, and Churchill would be sorely disappointed in the years that followed uh, by the failure of FDR and those who succeeded him to abide by it. As I'm sure we all know very well, the American bomb project, codenamed the Manhattan Project, pressed onwards towards the bomb. After Quebec, British scientists were more directly involved and Churchill more regularly appraised of its progress. However, when it came time to use atomic weapons in combat for the first time in 1945, first on the city of Hiroshima, Japan, and then Nagasaki, the decision was all American, however much Churchill might have painted it differently in retrospect. Of course, by the time the bombs dropped in Japan, Churchill was no longer prime minister, the Tories having lost the general election in July 1945. It was as leader of the opposition that he confidently announced the bomb as a product of joint British-American ingenuity. Although Churchill looked forward to future atomic development in partnership with the United States, this would not come to pass. In August 1946, the US President Harry Truman signed the McMahon Act, uh, also known as the Atomic Energy Act. This sharply restricted the sharing of nuclear information, including sharing nuclear information with its allies, uh, Britain and Canada. The atomic partnership, to the extent that it had existed, was no more. And it was only a few short months after this, under Clement Attlee, that Britain decided in January 1947 to launch its own atomic bomb program. 
Now, in these first post-war years, these first years after 1945, Churchill believed that the United States ought to use its nuclear advantage in order to subdue Soviet Russia, to contain its expansionist tendencies, especially as these were manifesting themselves in Eastern Europe. But the Americans under Truman didn't share this view. It was soon moot anyway. The American nuclear monopoly came to an end in August 1949 when the USSR tested its first nuclear weapon. And this happened four years earlier than intelligence to that point had predicted. So it was that uh, two years later, when Churchill once again assumed the role of prime minister in October 1951, he found himself now negotiating a world of dual atomic superpowers. In the first years of his second premiership, Churchill seemed to think that Britain would do its best to get its nuclear arsenal from the United States. In fact, he nearly derailed the first British atomic bomb test, Operation Hurricane, in October of 1952 with his steadfast faith in the British-American partnership. It was the specter of thermonuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs, as they are often called, vastly more powerful than atomic bombs, that flipped Churchill's thinking on this completely, transforming his ambivalence about British capacity to produce atomic bombs into absolute determination that it should make its own thermonuclear devices. The awesome destructiveness of these weapons only truly came to light in March 1954, after a series of American tests in the Pacific surprised even the Americans uh, with their explosive magnitude. Churchill, along with others at that time, reasoned that a small, densely populated Britain, home to US air bases and positioned within striking distance of nuclear-armed Soviet Russia, would be annihilated in the event of thermonuclear war. So it was to contain the possibilities of such war, whether initiated by the Soviets or the Americans, Britain needed its own H-bomb. Churchill's last great speech in Parliament, delivered in March 1955, one month before he stepped down as Prime Minister, was an impassioned defense of the newly proposed British thermonuclear program as the key to deterring future thermonuclear war. That is a whirlwind tour but these are the events that frame our discussion tonight and inform the histories um, or are part of the histories that Kevin and Graham have written. I'm gonna leave a slide up with some of the important dates that I've just mentioned for your reference as part of this conversation, but I'm now gonna turn things over to Ke Graham and to Kevin in turn to tell us what they have learned from their study of these events before we then move to a dialogue and then open discussion and, and questions from you. Graham. Thank you very much, uh, Helen, for that uh, uh, comprehensive uh, introduction to our, our, uh, our theme tonight. I'm delighted to be here back at uh, Churchill College, uh, where uh, both Kevin and I did uh, so much uh, of the research in our respective books. Let me begin with a quote. Scientific advances require long-term investment. This is why we must have programs such as a viable space program and institutional research that serves as incubators to innovation and the advancement of science and engineering. Those noble words uh, were spoken by uh, Donald Trump on the 13th of September 2016. Obviously well prepared for the scientific aspects of his, uh, his job. He was echoing, maybe unknowingly, uh, a, a part of the, one of the last speeches that Churchill made on these grounds 57 years before, when he mentioned two of those, uh, those themes. Churchill was spectacularly well prepared for, uh, to, to, to lead uh, his, his country in terms of his, his appreciation of the value of uh, science and technology. And in particular, his... Uh, his preparedness to handle nuclear weapons uh, is, in, in, in my opinion, uh, quite, uh, quite remarkable, as I want to uh, uh, set out in, uh, in, in these brief remarks. Just let me begin with a prefatory comment that at an event here at Churchill College, I was privileged to meet Mary Soames, uh, Churchill's uh, last surviving child, who told me at a, a reception here that you have to remember that Winston Churchill was as much a writer as a politician. That comment made a deep uh, impact on me and I believe is, uh, is a very wise 
uh, observation, particularly uh, in the context of Churchill's relationship to uh, uh, nuclear weapons. If you look at uh, Churchill's uh, vast career, and we're only talking about a, uh, a, a small part of it, then you can see, uh, it, it shocked me when I found it, it uh, initially happened upon it on the, in the archives, just how far-sighted he was about uh, nuclear weapons. This is somebody who was not a particularly talented uh, scientist, had no real appreciation for what you might call uh, fundamental science, writing with considerable foresight about the possibility of nuclear weapons in 1931. Talking off in an offhand comment in that article about the possibility of discovering what we later call the neutron. That was discovered eight weeks after that article was published. This is somebody who was chairing a discussion about the great nuclear discoveries in the Cavendish uh, laboratory uh, uh, shortly after uh, they were made by Rutherford's uh, students and collaborators. This is somebody who wrote a string of articles in the 1930s in very prominent uh, newspaper, newspaper fora about the possibility of nuclear energy being released. This was at a time, remember, where the te international tensions were growing. If you think that's a coincidence, about seven weeks before the discovery of nuclear fission in the capital of Nazi Germany, Churchill was warning of the possibility of nuclear energy being released imminently. Quite extraordinary. Was he getting that from his own reading? No, he was getting it from his friendship with Frederick Lindemann that uh, Helen uh, mentioned. Lindemann had, had, uh, uh, had superseded the great H.G. Wells as the principal uh, influence on, uh, on Churchill's uh, view of, of science in the early 1920s. For Churchill realised acutely that in order to be a successful politician, he must have some grasp of the scientific technological uh, issues uh, at, at the time and that he needed expert help. Critical realisation, in, in my opinion, one we shouldn't uh, underestimate. So when he came to sit in, uh, at the Prime Minister's uh, chair in May 1940, he had at his side uh, uh, Lindemann and uh, Sir John Anderson, another uh, qualified, uh, qualified scientist. Within weeks of taking up that position, way down in, the, uh, in, uh, in his entry was this possibility uh, that Frisch and Piles had brilliantly identified in Birmingham that it was actually possible, contrary to what m the great majority of physicists thought, it might be possible to build a nuclear weapon. And I have to say that Churchill and also Chamberlain uh, uh, deserve the credit for the early nurturing of that idea, which... Uh, I have to say, was de developed with exemplary carefulness by the committees that, uh, that, uh, that Helen uh, described. Although it's true that we now know that the UK could never have built the, uh, those nuclear weapons, uh, they, they uh, evaluated the possibility of developing su uh, such weapons with, with extraordinary uh, care. Perhaps... Less impressive were the relations that uh, Churchill, uh, Lindemann and others had with the nuclear scientists on the ground. If you look at the way Churchill was handling uh, the, uh, the development of, uh, of nuclear weapons, it's very difficult to actually characterise in a pithy way. He was quite wary of giving too much away to uh, the Americans. Of course, he was always very much a fan of these, what, uh, what he characterised as a special relationship. But he also was extraordinarily trusting of their goodwill, something that I, I, I think it fair to say was a, a trust that was not, uh, uh, was not uh, fully repaid. And it ended up, uh, really, it was, uh, it was I think uh, you, you could characterise it as embarrassing, uh, when, he, uh, when he was basically realised he was being strung along around April 1943, some years uh, after he took up the prime ministerial role, and Britain found itself having missed the bus uh, as the great historian Margaret Gowing put it, where they had to end up hitching a ride on the, uh, the Manhattan Project, with about two dozen British scientists in a, a team of thousands of people, uh, a, a project that was bankrolled and led very firmly by the United States. It's my view, uh, in broad brush, that uh, uh, that, that 
uh, that Britain, with its uh, early lead in the nuclear project, early scientific lead, uh, uh, could have capitalised much more effectively uh, on that, something that we're, we, uh, we could discuss. It's virtual history, so there's lots of different perspectives there. Uh, but I, I, I don't think uh, that, uh, that Britain made the most of its position, and I'm absolutely certain that the scientists concerned felt that, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that the most wasn't made of, 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 of the British lead. After the war with, of course, uh, uh, Churchill uh, summarily uh, uh, kicked out, as he put it, uh, he was in opposition, and uh, w uh, uh, both Kevin and I look at his, uh, his, his role in opposition, where he... Uh, where, constantly harping on about the, uh, the Quebec agreement that, uh, uh, that Helen mentioned, that he apparently took more seriously than just about anybody else. Uh, uh, he thought it was, was pretty much a treaty, right? The, I, I, I don't think I could name for you someone in a very well-informed high places who would agree, uh, agree with him. And he was constantly uh, dismissive of, of Attlee and his colleagues in, in failing to uh, uh, maintain a proper American cooperation during that, that time. Of course, Churchill at that, uh, in, that, in that period of opposition was writing his uh, agenda-setting and beautifully written uh, memoirs, uh, and a, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the spokespeople, so to speak, of, the, uh, of what became known as the, of, of, of the Cold War. Uh, what is very clear, although not, not that well known outside uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, in, in the standard literature, is that Churchill was quite content to advocate in private a showdown with the Soviet Union while the Americans had the monopoly of, of nuclear, nuclear weapons. Against, I think, what you might call the odds, uh, Churchill was uh, returned as, as Prime Minister and again brought Lindemann, the ailing Lindemann back to his side. He knew that he needed Lindemann uh, in, the, uh, uh, in his second uh, premiership. And that's where I think things get very interesting relative to the standard uh, um, uh, um, way of looking at this because Churchill got, uh, really got cold feet in terms of uh, de developing Britain's nuclear capability. And contrary to the line advocated in, in a very influential way by C.P. Snow, uh, Lindemann was somebody who was, uh, was, was advocating what you might call a coherent nuclear policy, whereas Churchill uh, was, was prepared to, uh, to, to, uh, to rely very heavily on American support. He thought that Britain needed the art, not the article of nuclear weapons. And some of the most, well, in fact, the most unpleasant and direct memos ever seen between Lindemann and Churchill were written in that context. But to Churchill's credit, Lindemann held uh, held sway and forged an excellent relationship with the scientists and engineers who built uh, uh, Britain's nuclear capability during that, uh, during that time. And uh, again, I think it's only fair to give Churchill the credit for the fact that Britain uh, developed its own uh, nuclear weapon, a, a, a functioning uh, nuclear uh, power industry and research uh, uh, operation that underpinned both, which was led by our first master, uh, Sir John uh, Cockcroft. Towards the end of that uh, period, as, as Helen has uh, uh, very lucidly uh, described, the Cold War uh, environment, uh, Churchill saw very, very clearly as, uh, as, as an extremely worrying one with the advert, advent of thermonuclear weapons. And although it's something we, uh, we're, I'm, we're going to discuss, in my opinion, uh, his uh, attempts at arranging a detente between the, the, t the emerging two superpowers, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, with him, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the honest broker uh, b uh, between the two, was, uh, uh, was, uh, was an admirable one in its intention, even if it was uh, not, in the end, uh, successful. Enoch Powell's famous aphorism in his uh, uh, biography of Joseph Chamberlain, all political careers end in failure. Uh, uh, I, I personally think that uh, 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 Churchill uh, would have accepted that of his own career, certainly in, in, in its uh, nuclear uh, aspect. As a politician, in my view, and I'm talking about the broadest brush here, he failed to see the importance of nuclear weapons until it was too late. And when he finally did realise it, he lacked the 
uh, political uh, clout to implement his good intentions. That was at the end of his, uh, uh, his second period as pri prime minister. The irony is, in my view, that the political uh, Churchill could have uh, acted perhaps uh, more authoritatively and wisely if only he'd read the articles that he'd written before the war. So, altogether, yes, Churchill, politician and writer, in nuclear terms, more successful, in my view, as a writer and sage than as a politician. Thank you. Well, good evening. Um, I'd like to echo Graham and um, extend a thank you to Churchill College, to the Archive Centre as well, to Alan and to Helen for giving me this wonderful platform for an hour or so to talk about my work. Um, it's just about, as Alan indicated, as appropriate a platform as you could really wish for when the subject is Churchill and science and indeed nuclear weapons. But it's appropriate for me in a, in a sort of personal sense as well, because it was my work with the Churchill Archive, and by that I mean the online digital repository of Churchill's papers, which is a joint venture between the Archive Centre here and Bloomsbury Publishing. It was my work on that online archive which um, really set me going on Churchill and the bomb. That online archive, by the way, if you don't know is one of the most important and valuable innovations of this digital age. Um, most remarkably of all, although the archive is subscription only for universities and for other grown-up institutions and organizations, for schools in the United Kingdom and North America and further afield, it's absolutely free which is one of the most spectacular value for money options that are out there in the world today. Anyway, for the online archive, I was asked to write two web essays, one on Churchill and the Cold War, one on Churchill and nuclear weapons. And it quickly became apparent to me, as I did my background research, that Churchill and the bomb was the greatest story never told, or at least the greatest story never told about Churchill, beginning with his youthful fascination with science, his love of science fiction, Graham's already mentioned H.G. Wells, carrying on through his collaborative publications in popular science format with Lindemann during the 1930s, right into the Second World War, the race to get an atomic bomb before Nazi scientists delivered one into, into Hitler's hands, and then pushing on through into the post-war world, into the Cold War era, the era of weapons of mass destruction, of this hideous, monstrous thermonuclear weapon, the, the hydrogen bomb. On he went. Also, in, in, in my view, I'd echo Graham on this being a nuclear visionary, even in, as he approached 80. Um, in October 1953, for example, you could argue he was a pioneer, a pioneer of something called mutually assured destruction. I think I'm quoting pretty accurately, but, but in the House of Commons in October 1953, he said that he looked forward to one day when, if everybody could kill everybody else, maybe nobody would want to kill anybody at all. And if that's not a sort of Churchillian version of mutually assured destruction, I'm not sure what is, he would go on and develop that um, 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 over the last 18 months of his frontline political life. Now, as an academic historian, I am always on red alert for, it's a cliche, but for gaps in the literature that need filling. And uh, frankly, I thought I had found a humongous gap, an enormous gap. And a gap, moreover, in the literature concerning just about the most written about statesman maybe of all time. I couldn't believe my luck, but my luck didn't last. About six months after Bloomsbury issued me a contract for my book, um, a chap called Graham Farmelow <laughs> published a book called Churchill's Bomb. Now, if you bear in mind that my book was called Churchill and the Bomb, you can see, you can see what a blow this was. 
and the blows kept coming. In the first instance, Graham's book was reviewed, it seemed to me, everywhere, and really annoyingly, brilliantly well reviewed everywhere. So um, if you know your Churchill acronyms and his fondness for abbreviations, it was, I think, after a little while, once I picked myself off the floor, it was a case of KBO. Um, I decided to keep going. Bloomsbury were very good. I decided to write the book that I was always going to write and pretend that Graham did not exist. <laughs> and so off I went. Now, to be honest, I, I, clearly, I did read his book, but only towards the end of the process when my own thought processes had crystallized, and that seemed to me to be the right way to do it. But when I read his book, book, it was the most grievous blow of all, because those reviewers had been right. It was brilliant. A scintillating read, and I have to say, it still scintillates. I've reread it. I did my revision, students out there. I've revised for this evening. I, I reread it, and it really, is, it really is terrific. But once I picked myself off the canvas for a second time, I think I realized that what we'd done was something rather different. Now, clearly, um, the plot line was similar. But our emphases, uh, the trajectories of our arguments, just the general slant we brought to bear turned out to be quite different. When I allowed the, the mist to clear from my eyes, we were doing different but complementary things. Now, Graham focused clearly on Churchill, but uh, I, I don't wish to misrepresent you, Graham, but um, as much it seems sometimes on the scientists and on the science, the scientists who, who worked with and for Churchill during the war and after the war. I'm an international historian, or at any rate a Cold War historian for the most part, and my emphasis was much more sustainedly on the geostrategic political aspects, the, the role of the bomb in Churchill's worldview, his thinking, his policy, his strategy, and so on and so forth. And so, here we are. Let me end my brief little introduction by um, quoting from the late Robert Rhodes James, who was a fine historian and also, um, many of you will know, and some of you will probably recall, um, I believe the MP for this very city for quite a number of years. Um, Robert Rhodes James wrote that the quandary of Winston Churchill may be simply expressed. There were so many Winston Churchills. Then he listed them. Politician, sportsman, artist, orator, historian, parliamentarian, journalist, essayist, gambler, soldier, I may have to speed up, Helen, war correspondent, adventurer, patriot, internationalist, dreamer, pragmatist, strategist, monarchist, democrat, egocentric, hedonist, you should read David Locke's book on, called No More Champagne on Churchill's Finances, Romantic. Well, uh, between us, I think Graham and I, in our different ways, are adding another Churchill to the list. And that's the nuclear Churchill, which has brought us here this evening and brought you, which is very kind of you to turn up. And uh, we're going to get on and chat now, I think. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, um, Graham and Kevin, for your comments. Um, I think in the course of them, we've learned um, certainly from, from Kevin about what drew you to tell this story. Clearly, there was a need to really explore in depth Churchill, the nuclear Churchill, um, as we've just learned. Um, but when you got into uh, trying to understand and tell this story of the nuclear Churchill, what surprised you most in the materials you found? Or what, what, um, was there anything that was particularly unexpected about the story? Um, OK. Um, am I OK with this radio mic? Is it OK? Um, I made the qualification that um, Churchill and the Bomb was, well, I thought, I thought it was the greatest story never told. The, the story of the bomb is amongst the greatest stories ever. It's, it's an extraordinary story in and of itself. As for Churchill's role, um, um, I won't say how old I am, but I, I kept off Churchill for a long time in my career. It, it sort of, um, 
it was like an actor coming to uh, King Lear, really. I felt that I couldn't do him as a young man or even a middle-aged man, but you know, I'm still middle-aged. Anyway, whatever. I, 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 need, I, I, I was scared of tackling Churchill, and, and I was accidentally drawn into him, um, but I felt that I needed, um, I needed a certain maturity in my, own, in my own mind to actually deal with him. And so there we are. I, 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 I came to Churchill that way, but because I'd, I'd studied Churchill in a roundabout way for a long time, I came with certain ideas that had kind of become slightly fixed, and some of these had to be unfixed. Um, I'll just give you a couple now, the, the surprises, if you like. Um, the first surprise, I think, was that if you, if you do your preparation for a research project like this, you do, you do all your reading, and you find there's a big consensus out there that says that during the Second World War, Churchill, from 1941 onwards, when he gives the green light to tube alloys, the, the British project, which becomes subsumed by the Manhattan Project, he was a raging atomic monopolist. He wanted Britain, the United States, and indeed the Canadians to keep this as the closest of close secrets. It is argued that the British Chiefs of Staff didn't know really the details of this thing till very near the end, the service ministers. It was a real secret, and this was on Churchill's insistence. So he's an atomic monopolist. Around about 1943, 1944, He's beginning to be told by very close advisors like John Anderson, who's effectively the minister for the bomb. Um, he's also being told indirectly and eventually directly by the great and revered Danish physicist Niels Bohr that it is almost a racing certainty that the Soviet Union will get, at some point after the war, its own atomic weapons, that the Soviet Union has the scientific intelligence, it has the resources, it's going to get this thing. And the question, therefore, arises, should we share the secret of the bomb, not in detail, but at least tell Stalin in 43 or 44 that we're working on a weapon, uh, we will use it if it's ready against the common enemy, and after that, Joe, we would like to settle down and work with you after the war in constructing a system of international control to make sure this force is used for good, not bad, for constructive, not destructive purposes. Churchill was, I think, rabidly resistant to the idea of sharing the bomb with Stalin, or even the idea of the bomb. Now, that fitted with everything I knew about Churchill, the great anti-communist, the legendary anti-Bolshevik from 1917 onwards. And many historians had written that what Churchill was hoping to do was to keep it a close secret and, in fact, at a later point, use the Anglo-American atomic monopoly as a possible lever in making sure that Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union behaved in the right way after the war. So I went into the research with that particular point in mind, and I found that he's not saying that that the evidence didn't stack up. He was certainly an atomic monopolist, and certainly from Potsdam, when he learns of the first successful atomic test, Churchill is what I would call an atomic diplomatist, using the bomb potentially as a lever. But before that, he wasn't. So what was his atomic covetousness all about? And the answer I came up with, it's not to do with the Russians, it's to do with the Americans. What drove Churchill during the Second World War was the vision of the most intimate, post-war Anglo-American and indeed Commonwealth or English-speaking alliance. He was told by those experts around him that knew a thing or two about this atomic bomb that if there was to be an enduring Anglo-American partnership during and after the war, after the war when the secret was out, it could only be a partnership within a formal military alliance. And that formal military alliance in itself would probably take life within the grander conception of an Anglo-America. Churchill didn't want just to keep the Russians out of the secret. He didn't want the French knowing in any formal sense, the provisional French government of de Gaulle after 1944. He wanted everybody out because that would break the Anglo-American combine that he saw as central to his post-war view of how Britain was going to go about its business. That's not to say he wasn't mindful of the leverage the bomb could bring, but he's most mindful of that only, in my view, in mid-1944. 
45. I was going to give you two, but I have gone on so long, I'm only going to give you one to start with. So that was a surprise to me, that he was arming not just against an enemy, but in a different way, obviously, kind of against an ally or with an ally, alongside an ally. Graham? Right. Um, let me just preface this comment. Uh, Kevin, Kevin's been so so very kind about my book. Uh, I have to say I had it in reverse because when I read Kevin's book, uh, I found myself uh, saying repeatedly, I wish I'd said that, wish I'd said that, wish I'd said that. So let's call it a draw. Um, uh, uh, and I'm very happy for it to be regarded as such. Um, I, it might be uh, interesting for... Uh, our friends here, uh, to, I came for it for a completely different angle. Remember, I came for it from the point of view of a physicist. Uh, uh, you, you've heard in, in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Kevin's comments that uh, he was talking about the uh, international perspective uh, and, and all that, which I, I, I only vaguely knew about. What I had heard about uh, in the course of my own research on Paul Dirac and other things as well was how these scientists uh, used to openness, uh, absolutely unused to the world of politics, suddenly got drawn into this, uh, into international politics. It's, it still strikes me as remarkable. I mean, the, the analogy today, remember, the, this was state-of-the-art uh, sub-nuclear uh, physics that suddenly became projected uh, uh, into uh, international politics. This is a bit like people working on string theory today, whiling away their time in abstraction, suddenly finding themselves in the White House, right? How could that? It's extremely remarkable. And several anecdotes hit me. Uh, and their specificity, uh, uh, it, they, may, they may sound trivial, but they were very vivid to me. Dirac's daughter told me that her peaceable father, equable father, uh, she'd never seen him so angry as when he got a letter from the government in, was it July 1945, saying that he couldn't go to Russia, right? And because the Prime Minister had decided that it was a security risk. Dirac, who, who had been working, uh, uh, doing theoretical work on the bomb, thought, we're on the Russian side. Why can't I go and see my friends again? He was absolutely livid. And I found, and I, of course, followed that up and saw other people were too. There's the character of Lindemann, who I knew was absolutely detested by many scientists, in particular those at the, uh, at the Cavendish, including Rutherford. Now, it's all very trivial, this, but I thought, this is very odd. What was the dynamic like here when you had Lindemann detested by these nuclear physicists who, were, uh, who had the ear of the, of the Prime Minister during, during the war? In terms of the, uh, oh, and of course, Bohr. Uh, the the uh, the, uh, the point that uh, that Kevin made there the the great disaster of the Bohr uh, Churchill uh, meeting in uh, 19, 1944, which I still regard as unforgivable that uh, he was uh, Bohr was treated so rudely, uh, and I, I I still keep an open mind about uh, about the uh, the wisdom of, of both parties in that, but uh, certainly it was it was an incident that 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 I thought that there's enough dramatic potential there uh, to, uh, for for a readable book to be, uh, to be uh, to be written, but in just a pick one particular thing that said about the surprise, I have to say that I, I've already presented it to you. And I remember very clearly, right, I remember thinking, uh, I've read in biographies of Churchill that he wasn't really very interested in science, he was, he, he was very modest about his uh, 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 abilities in mathematics and what have you. So I rather expected that all I would ever find out about Churchill was somebody who was interested in uh, um, applied science. I knew that he loved gizmos, like Lindemann did, uh, and, 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 and practical, practical applications of science. What I had no idea about right, was that uh, the extent to which Churchill was writing about science, and the extent, incidentally, to which he engaged with it. I mean, it's not satisfactory to say that uh, Churchill took Lindemann's draft articles and wrote Churchill at the end of it and pocketed a massive fee. That's true, incidentally. It's partially true. Uh, he, did, he did pocket huge fees, which he only gave Lindemann a small amount. Um, but what is important is that Churchill actually rewrote some of those articles, interestingly, putting the bomb at the top. 
So it, it, it makes no sense to say that Churchill was simply parroting uh, uh, Lind Lindemann's comments. He really did appreciate in the 1930s that there was a new kind of technology afoot here. And something that I didn't stress nearly enough there was that the real luminaries of physics, I'm talking about uh, Bohr, I'm talking uh, about Rutherford, I'm talking about Fermi and people like that, really were playing down, you could even say poo-pooing, the prospect of a nuclear weapon. Uh, Churchill, right, taking the imaginative thread from the H.G. Wells book, which he almost certainly read as soon as it came out. Remember, he read all of Wells's books twice. Uh, so he would have read the Atomic Bomb uh, in 1914, right? So it really, it really does seem to be a reasonable thing to say that Churchill had engaged with this prospect. What I still don't understand fully, I have to say, is, as I said at the end of my, my, my comments there, of uh, uh, why the, his engagement was so partial. Mm. All right? I still don't fully understand that. Uh, uh, and something that I've seen dismissed by his, uh, historians, and not, not, I think, by Kevin. I don't think you mentioned this, Kevin, unless I missed it. Um, but that Bohr, uh, when he was with his great friend, uh, Sir John Anderson, uh, was, in, as we say these days, tearing his hair out because of Churchill's lack of a scientific perspective, right? Uh, he, he, uh, they, they were having real trouble getting through to Churchill about the, uh, uh, about the momentousness of what, what, they was go what, uh, what, they were, what they were doing in developing the bomb. That was a big surprise to me. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I want to stick with the character of Frederick Lindemann for just a second. Mm -hmm. I think, because one of the things that I was so astonished by in reading your books um, was Churchill's uh, dependency in his decision making in some ways or the extent to which he depended on uh, the physicist Frederick Lindemann, later Lord, Lord Churwell. Um, and I think this is a point where one can and to a certain extent you both do assess Churchill as making an error in judgment in narrowing his, um, his uh, sort of source of advice so, so much. So is there any way to exonerate, I think, Churchill for his reliance on the prof uh, for, for advice? Um, perhaps we should slightly preface um, the, uh, the Lindemann thing. And Churchill first met Lindemann, I believe, in 1921. Um, Lindemann was the Lees Professor of Experimental Physics at Oxford. And uh, Churchill uh, delighted in having uh, a scientist on tap. Um, not people, on top. Not on top. That's a, very, <laughs> that's a very important qualification. Churchill did say scientists should be on tap and not on top. Now, um, so their friendship develops during the, uh, during the 1920s, and uh, we've alluded to the collaborationist relationship they have with publishing um, um, material um, in various um, popular magazines and newspapers about scientific developments, not least nuclear developments. Um, so they're very close. Uh, Churchill is extraordinarily close to Lindemann during his wilderness years in the 1930s. He doesn't ever forget Lindemann's constancy. Mm -hmm. um, that, and, the, and the two of them actually do combine from the mid-30s in trying to press the government to rearm against the developing Nazi threat, particularly in the air. Now, um, a contemporary um, diarist, Henry, uh, uh, Chips Channon, uh, once remarked that Churchill's loyalty to friends is one of his most endearing and positive qualities. Fine, I think that being loyal to friends is endearing and positive and so on and so forth. But when Churchill became prime minister in 1940, he brought Lindemann with him into the heart of government. And by the way, it wasn't just the scientists who loathed Lindemann. Um, Jock Colville said there was no more detested figure in Whitehall than that of the tall, bibola, dark, <laughs> strange F.A. Lindemann. Because Churchill brings him in, only takes Lindemann's advice, because he is his friend after all, drives the other scientists who are working for the government to despair. Because if, if the prime minister is only going to rely on one scientist during the war, it's pretty important that that scientist is more often right than wrong. <laughs> and the problem with, with the prof, as he was universally known, is that he was quite often wrong. <laughs> but he, had the, he, he was, without question, um, and Graham may correct me on this, the most influential scientist to 
certainly up to that point and for a long time thereafter to be, be, be there at the heart of, heart of Whitehall. So the problem with Lindemann is he was Churchill's friend and that drove lots of people nuts. My last point on this is, is the seminal moment comes and there's a, there's a minute written by Churchill on the 30th of August, 1941. And this is the minute, this is the little note that green lights the British Atomic Project. And if you look at that closely, and as a historian I'm supposed to dissect sources for every little subtlety, it says, I agree with the argument put forward by Lord Charwell. And then it goes to the chiefs of staff who, although they don't know much about the, the science side of it, they say, we too effectively agree with the arguments of Lord Charwell. And from those two agreements of August 1941, Britain's tube alloys program is born. It will be taken over in late 42. It will be subsumed in late 42. An incredibly important figure, but a figure who is within the scientific community as divisive as he is unifying, really, but, but critical. Churchill did not do the, we talk, we talk about Churchill's bomb. Churchill was not doing the bomb on his own. He, he had these key figures, and he took crucial advice from them. Yes, just, I, I, just to add, uh, first of all, it, it's, we haven't actually talked that much about this, but C.P. Snow, uh, soon after the uh, uh, famous or infamous two Two, uh, two Cultures book wrote the story of Lindemann, right? Which became a bestseller. That's why, because the Two Cultures book was so popular, Lindemann became the focus of, uh, of, of public attention because he, Snow, great friend of many of the Cavendish people, absolutely detested Lindemann. And I, I think that that is deeply flawed. Very entertaining read, but deeply flawed. First of all, uh, Churchill cannot be faulted in the quality of scientist he, uh, uh, he befriended there. Uh, Lindemann had references when he, uh, he was a, a real friend of Einstein. I've, I've seen the word friend used by Einstein. It's not just made up. He, uh, uh, he had references from Rutherford. They don't come better than that. He had re uh, reference from Michelson when he went to, uh, to Oxford. And he was charged with building up a department that uh, could ri uh, rival the uh, Cavendish. So uh, there was no doubt that he was a very, very good scientist, very, in, very clever uh, not as clever as he thought he was, but he was very clever, uh, uh, blessed with the ability of the, of the, of the sudden insight, as uh, his uh, uh, um, friend G.P. Thompson said. The problem was, I said, he, was with, with Lindemann, was not just that he had bad relations, but he did not have unerring judgment. Uh, Churchill's, in my opinion, the, uh, the, the worst flaw in, in, uh, in, uh, in Churchill's approach to science was not uh, in selecting Lindemann, it was in sidelining uh, Henry Tizard. Um, I think we've mentioned him so far, have we? All right, Henry Tizard, and I don't, I don't use the G word very often, but I will, I will use it in a quotation. G.P. Thompson said that, uh, uh, that uh, Sir Henry Tizard uh, was the greatest genius Britain had ever produced in the art of applying science and technology to warfare. That's an almost verbatim quote. Lindemann despised Tizard. It's a complicated relationship, a good book in itself. Right? They knew each other in Berlin. They fought boxing matches together and what have you. And, right? Right? But they ended up despising each other. Right? And it was quite clearly... Uh, Lindemann, who got Churchill to sideline that figure. In my judgment, that was a serious error on his part. At Lindemann's funeral, I forget the name, I'll be honest, I'm not going to make it up, uh, but somebody whispered to one of the lords, right, Winston was a bad picker, mm -hmm. right? And what he meant was that he invested, in that particular instance, he invested so much authority in one person. Now, one thing we know, ladies and gentlemen, about science is, uh, to use the motto of the Royal Society, take nobody's word for it. Nobody should have that kind of power, frankly. And in that respect, I agree with C.P. Snow. He, that's in, I think it's his last or penultimate par paragraph. In that, he's right. And Churchill, in my opinion, should... Uh, 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 I know it's easy to be wise after the event, but he, uh, he would have shown more wisdom if instead of giving so much power to, to Lindemann, Right? He had listened more widely to the applause, that were, the acclamation he, that, uh, that Tizard would, would have given him.
And so if just following on from that, one of the moments in which it seems that Churchill's not listening to the advice of a larger group of scientists or, or engineers or military advisors is in um, the early days of off, uh, uh, American collaboration or American offers of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So you referenced, I think, in your comments, Graham, this idea that Churchill missed the bus in terms of um, taking on uh, or responding quickly to an offer by uh, Franklin Roosevelt of having a shared collaborative um, Anglo-American bomb project. Mm -hmm. um, so to what extent um, should we think it significant that at that moment in time, Churchill didn't uh, sort of reach out and embrace the idea of the Anglo-American partnership? I think, Kevin, in your book, you seem to think maybe it, it wasn't actually as big a moment as we thought it was. Um, even though historians have said this was the missed opportunity, was it really an opportunity? So, um, well, well, I don't. Perhaps you, Graham. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, well, yes, I I come down on the side that uh, it was a missed opportunity. I have to say, as a mere physicist here, I realise there's so many different interpretations you can give mm. to this. I mean, FDR was the most. Uh, uh, lubricious character. I mean, it was, it was not easy to deal with him, mm. right? I think Churchill was very credulous of, of, uh, 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 of FDR. I think uh, FDR was a much shrewder, le le less pleasant person, but a shrewder political uh, op operator. But I'm minded, I know there's different arguments on this, that uh, that, that um, letter that, he ha that FDR had hand-delivered to Churchill offering a, uh, a, a close collaboration that much more could have been made to it. And I am picking in my book, and I think, I, I think this is actually quite a useful perspective, that to a de degree that is quite surprising, Churchill was very chary of getting too close to the Americas. He was extremely fed up with them for not backing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, Britain and its empire early in the war. But in particular, there's a very good case to say that in military technology, Britain had several advantages, se had several leads over the, uh, over the Americans. And Churchill's view quite clearly was, why should we give this lead away? And, he, and the, the famous Tizard mission to America, Ch Churchill took some persuading to let that mission go. So, so it's, it's not true to say right, that, Ch uh, that Churchill was always wanting to throw himself at America. He, he knew that in some ways Little Britain, right, which is a tiny country by comparison and resources, did have uh, some advantages, right? uh, did have some uh, uh, ways in which it was ahead. But um, if, you, uh, if you look at the nuclear thing as well, I think you can see that even there, goaded, no, I shouldn't say, uh, goaded is the wrong word, but... Uh, but uh, um, supported by Lindemann and other, others, uh, the, the people around Churchill at Whitehall did not want to embrace that uh, approach of, uh, of, uh, of FDR. Just one last comment. I am virtually certain that if uh, Oliphant, who was the boss of Frisham Piles, and others, right, who eventually took it to their own hands, went to the researchers in America, if they'd known that Churchill had turned that down, they would have been apoplectic. In fact, Oliver was apoplectic after the war when he heard about that, right? because the scientists, very internationalist in outlook, were constantly pushing to bring their American friends and colleagues into the nuclear, uh, in, 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 into the nuclear secret. Oh, well, uh, speaking as a historian of missed buses, um, I think it was a missed bus, um, just to go back one step. Um, nuclear research, or, or the application of um, you know, the, or, the, or the potential to to create a weapon um, um, had been in the United States. Let's say the Americans had been struggling between 1939 and 1941. The Einstein letter, famous Einstein letter of August 39, etc. They stroll, and then around about um, October 1941, they start jogging. And part of the reason they jog is they get hold of the Maud report, and they see that the British have done a lot of very important theoretical work and that this is a, is a, real, a real weapon, potentially. And then Pearl Harbor happens in December 1941 and the Americans start sprinting and they will not stop till they go through the tape in August 1945. Yeah. Now, in the midst of this, yes, um, Roosevelt writes to Churchill, October 1941. It's not a long letter. It's about four or five lines and says, uh, how about it, Winston? Your people and our people, we get together and look at the, you know, the sharing and the exploring fervor of this atomic business. Churchill doesn't reply for nearly 
six, seven, eight weeks, I think, which is unheard of um, in, a, in, a, in a man who at an earlier point said that, uh, I'm not going to do a Churchill accent, but uh, maybe I'll do a slight one. It says, you know, sort of, um, uh, sort of, no lover ever studied the whims of his mistress as I did those of Franklin Roosevelt. So he leaves it eight weeks. In those eight weeks, I think, under advisement from Lindemann and others, uh, it says, no, we can do it on our own. We can do it on our own. We don't, we don't, we don't need them. We're way ahead. We, we can do it. And Churchill, he doesn't so much say no, but kind of is so dismissive of, of it that, 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 it, that, it, that it goes nowhere. But, Helen, you did allude to, to this observation. I just wonder, and of course, one, as a historian, you get a nosebleed when you end up doing counterfactuals, so watch out for it. But if Churchill had said, oh, yeah, absolutely, let's get on and do it, I wonder whether that would have made any difference. Because one surprise to me in my research was that Winston Churchill might be and absolutely was a respecter of, a lover of the United States, the special relationship. But, you know, he'd had a funny relationship with the Americans in the 20s going into the 30s. But at the point we're talking about, absolutely, he was pro-American, undoubtedly. But I discovered that he knew very little about constitutional governance in the United States. He didn't know particularly, I think, the difference between a treaty and an executive agreement. There could have been an agreement made in 1941, but I tell you what, two things would have been exactly the same. One, Roosevelt would have died in April 45. Churchill, this is three things, would have been kicked out of office in July 1945. And the US Congress, in a spasm of nationalism in 1946, would have revoked the wartime agreements, as was their right to do. They would have just revoked a third agreement, I suspect. But as I say, I can feel my nose twitching now, and I ought to really row back from uh, such speculations. So it was a missed bus moment, but I just wonder whether the bus, had it been taken, would have taken Churchill to where he thought it would have taken him if that's not too convoluted. No, thank you. So we've been talking about <coughs> Churchill in um, wartime only. We should move a little bit onwards to the, the, the post-war Churchill and maybe just quickly um, and then move on to opening up to, to questions from the floor. So one last question I'll, I'll put to you. Um, is uh, the, the post-war Churchill who's um, interested in the idea that a, nuclear weapons could be used to contain the kind of Soviet menace? Um, one thing I'm not clear on is what Churchill actually felt about whether the bomb should be used or how. Um, to what extent was it kind of a saber rattling, that's the manner in which they should be used, or should bombs actually be dropped? Should the, should the US be willing to bomb uh, the USSR? Can you clarify that for me? What was, what was Churchill's position? What you find after 1945, for about four to five years after 1945, if you put all his private references to the bomb together in a critical mass, if I can use that term, um, you'll find that he is saying one thing and one thing only, which is before the Soviet Union gets an atomic bomb, we need to have it out with them. We need a showdown with the Soviet Union. By a showdown, he meant a diplomatic showdown, but it would be a diplomatic showdown in which the, the American monopoly, which, and, you know, which was there from 45 to 49, the American monopoly should be used in some imprecisely conceptualized way to lever Stalin into behaving. And I think Churchill had in mind that the Soviet Union should withdraw from Eastern Europe and allow free and democratic elections to prevail in Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, and elsewhere. And so he holds this position. And of course, a lot of people say, well, he says it privately, he doesn't say it publicly. I don't think he says it publicly because it would be just about the most unpopular thing you could say at a point when a lot of people in this country um, by 1947, 48, you know, Berlin crisis and so on. There are, there's actually there's a war scare out there. People are, are troubled, and this sounds like a, an, an, an aggressive posture to take at a time when dear old Ernie Bevin and Labour are trying to um, reconcile differences with the Soviet Union and try and avoid any sort of slip into, slip into war. He keeps it private, which, of course, allows everybody to say he was just showboating in private, and that's the kind of thing that Winston does from, from time to time. I suspect that there was a seriousness of intent born of his severe anti-Sovietism. Um, but at the end of the day, the Truman administration turns out to be rather more sane and sensible than Churchill um, um, was at that point, in my view. And it never makes sort of nuclear saber rattling an explicit part of its Cold War armory. But then things change. The Soviet Union gets a bomb in 1949. There's more Soviet tests in 1951. Churchill becomes increasingly aware of the vulnerability, Helen mentioned it earlier, of this particular country with its density of population, small land mass. These weapons are getting bigger. This 
apocalyptic thing called the hydrogen bomb comes along in the early 1950s, and that really is a flipping point for Churchill, much more so, I think, than the 1949 Soviet bomb. It's the, it's the American hydrogen bomb and the thought of the Soviet Union getting a hydrogen bomb as well. He sees no coming back from hydrogen bomb attack, and the best way to avoid hydrogen bomb attack on the UK is to maybe think about stopping hot war, and to stop hot war, you need to get rid of a thing called the Cold War because the Cold War can breed a hot war. And what you find in his final two to three years is, I think, by the end, a conviction-driven attempt to use his great prestige, also partly an excuse to hang on to power, perhaps, when others are queuing up, particularly Anthony Eden, to take over. But I think there's a conviction-driven attempt to try and, in, in, in his own words, chain the thermonuclear monster. He fails, but I think it was... Um, something of a glorious failure, really, because in that process he does show himself to be somewhat visionary, and he did will almost the onset of mutually assured destruction, because if you can't get detente, you can't get Cold War peace, the best thing is strategic balance. Strategic imbalance, recipe for war. I, I, I don't have a lot to, uh, lot to add, add to that. Uh, I, I have to say, on because we're talking about something quite sensitive here, when my book came out... Uh, uh, several of the, of the uh, um, Churchill's loyal army of admirers, um, when I say several, a few, contacted me and said, I just don't believe this. He, could, he would never have said that. Mm. Right? Would never have said. Ha sorry, uh, that, uh, about talking about showdowns and mm. using the bomb and what have you. I think I found three. I know Kevin found a few more, and maybe there's more to be found. Uh, all I would say is that he, as Kevin said, that he always said it in private, but I don't think there's any doubt that he was saying that. I mean, I, it, because they are independent, in, independent sources. Uh, Did he? In, in, the, in the Tory, he comes very close to it. He says it at the Tory party conference in October 1948, and uh -huh. the Times writes a leader the next day saying, ooh, we don't think that Cold War differences ought to be settled by threatening to use the atomic bomb against mm -hmm. the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. if that is what Mr. Churchill was suggesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, again, that's again, the closest he comes to. Uh, in terms of actual precise wordings, though, uh, in, in, in these privates, I'm sorry, I can't remember it's been years since I looked at them. Did he ever say, uh, actually talk about use, your pointed question, mm. did he ever actually say he would use those weapons? He said, for example, to the Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King, yeah. Lord Moran, his doctor, to various others, that... I would issue, and he says it at the time of the Berlin crisis, because he's worried about appeasement of Stalin over Berlin. Mm. Um, his first volume of, um, um, of his history of the Second World War comes out during the Berlin crisis, and that first volume is a warning uh, to democracies to, uh, to uh, stand up to, not back down in the face of totalitarian aggression and so on and so forth. He's off down the south of France telling other people like Bob Boothby. He's saying, ultimatum, certain expiry date, if you do not withdraw from Eastern Europe, you're going to get this rain. Whether he would have done rain it or not. Now, yeah, yeah, now yeah, he is yeah, in opposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. He's, he's so not words in power. Are cheap, yeah. And of course, when he comes back into power, the, Anglo uh, the, the American monopoly is gone. Yeah. And he, 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 he rose back. Yes. Just as Donald Trump will almost mm. surely mm. row back. On that now. note, let's <laughs> turn and open uh, to questions from the audience. I think we have microphones that will be passed around. Um, so who's got a, a question for Kevin and Graham? We have one right here, it looks like, in the middle. You haven't mentioned the question of the Emperor of Japan being a fellow of the Royal Society and the final war cabinet being asked the question whether they believed it was an electrical weapon or it was Einstein's weapon. And at that point, they turned to the Emperor and he chose to say the words initiating negotiation. So the only thing we know about use of the atomic bomb in warfare is that it once initiating negotiation when the opponent was a fellow of the Royal Society. That's the only thing we know about atomic warfare. Do we 
have other questions? Here, this one. Yeah, I'm sorry, I might be a bit hazy on some of my uh, history here, so excuse me if you wouldn't mind. But don't you think once the bomb was dropped, the allure of the weapon was lost? Do you not think, with Churchill, that, that you said afterwards that he lost a bit of his, his understanding of... Or, or forgive his... me, what do you mean by... Did you say allure? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the allure's the wrong word, I beg your pardon, but the... No. the, the, the Mystery around the bomb, once it was actually dropped, do you think Churchill lost a bit of his fight, desire, realising how, what it could do, and therefore that reined him back? Hmm. I think this, if I can sort of, the, the question of viewing the, the nuclear weapons as conventional or not, mm -hmm. um, and the extent to which that, that plays into the story. Mm. I mean, once the weapon's been used, mm -hmm. People know about it. It loses that essence of what the weapon is. You move on to the next one. I think, it, if, if, if I may, I, think, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it did lose its allure. What you find, you've got the period of the American monopoly, 1945 to 1949. America is testing more weapons, visibly so, once there is a failure of the United Nations and other bodies to kind of contain this new power in any, in any sensible way. So America continues its testing. People are much more aware by the late 40s than they were in that kind of crazy end game of World War II as to what these atomic weapons will do. What Hiroshima and to an extent Nagasaki's gift to the world is they become almost adjectival ratings because as weapons get bigger, it's the number of Hiroshimas. And I think the allure, I think the horror of these weapons becomes greater. And so by the early 1950s, if you're talking about, um, you know, the Hiroshima weapon maybe being 18 kilotons and you've got a hydrogen bomb that's 10.4 megatons, people are able, because of what happened to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to visualize in their own mind what a weapon 10 times, 100 times, 200, 500 times as great as that is. And what that does for Churchill by the early 50s, however, as he moves from being a bit gung-ho to being a little bit more statesmanlike about the bomb, is um, it allows him to develop in his own mind the concept of deterrence. He thinks that the thing that keeps the Soviets out of Western Europe and the thing that will keep the peace in the Cold War is nuclear deterrence. And to that extent, you've got to build more and more of these things. But what he was hoping for is not the Americans to suddenly gain a great lead in massive weapons of, great, of, of mass destruction over the Soviets, but for the Soviets and the Americans to actually be roughly equal, because he did also worry that the Americans might go off in a madcap moment and do something that would see this country immolated. Because, and this is my last point here, it's a very important one, and it's another surprise to me, but it has been verified, up to about 1955, Soviet long-range bombers could hit London and Paris, but they couldn't get to North America. So if the Americans made a miscalculation and Cold War turned hot, it was London, Paris, East Anglia, those American air bases, that were going to feel, feel the lit literal heat of Soviet retaliation in a way the Americans weren't. So, so Churchill is, 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 no, in law is not quite the word I'd use, but... Uh, but, 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 but the fear grows, the nuclear fear and nuclear anxiety grows, and he uses it later. Yes, um, I just wanted to say that uh, one of the things that disappointed me about uh, Churchill, uh, there are plenty of things that deeply impressed me, I should say that, but was his reaction to that, to the first Trinity test. It was like a child, basically, playing with, with, with toy soldiers. Uh, you, 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 saw, you, you saw the account. It is not, a, you know, the, the grand reaction of, a, of, of the thoughtful statesman that, that we, we would like, I think. Um, uh, he, he would listen, of course, to people, and he did. Um, but one of the things that, again, uh, I don't think speaks particularly well of his uh, strategic thinking is that uh, his, uh, Lindemann's bête noire, Patrick Blackett, wrote a book in uh, 1948 uh, on the strategic uh, uh, use of nuclear weapons vis-a-vis uh, -vis conventional weapons. Now, uh, it is, uh, Blackett was, uh, I argue in the book, he, he's a scientist Lindemann wanted to be, uh, in the sense that he was a really brilliant uh, guy. He was also extremely left-wing, 
right? Uh, and I think there was a very complicated chemistry between the two. But Blackett as well was someone who'd actually fought in a war. He often said that Lindenburg never fought anything, right? But Blackett was at the Battle of Jutland, seeing people lay waste in front of his eyes, but was a deep, uh, deep thinking uh, uh, person about war and, and politics. It is fair to say that some of his attitudes were seen by even his friends as being off the wall, as we would now say. But his, if you go and read that book, free, my friend Freeman Dyson uh, as, as uh, emphasizes repeatedly to me, people like Freeman and, and scientists at that time and others were seeing that as an extremely thoughtful contribution where you say, well, how useful are these nuclear weapons? Right? It, while many people were talking of only nuclear exchanges in war, Blackett was talking about how, how useless they were in, in, in most combat. If you look at that, uh, at that volume of Blackett, I think there's a great deal that, uh, that, to, to, to commend his thinking. Not to say it's all correct, but it was a good deal more subtle than the kind of reasoning that uh, Churchill and some of his colleagues uh, were using. Just one thing, just to lighten the tone a minute, uh, um, that uh, Ch Churchill, as, as his great biographer Roy Jenkins says, uh, could be a spectacular, warm and generous person. He could also be incredibly mean-spirited, right, in a way that undercuts your image. And I will never forget in the great archive of, uh, here at the college, uh, being, uh, uh, help given by the, the, the fantastic archivist there, uh, having something drawn to my attention, which is that Blackett, who, who was one of the most important people in fighting the North, uh, uh, the North Atlantic War, right, with his strategic thinking and what, and what have you, his uh, application of uh, science to war, right? That was an incredibly important role for this country. He was put up for an honorary degree at Bristol, and Churchill, as Chancellor, struck him off. Unbelievable. Blackett was amongst the, uh, the first also to argue, including in the book, that the atomic bomb did not need to be used to end the war against Japan, yep. that there were alternatives that could have been pursued with greater vigour, but it was used not to end the war against Japan because Japan was essentially defeated. It was used as a, a, a statement of American power and leverage. Um, yep, that's right. So. Sure. We have a question up here in the front. Well, we've got lots of questions now. We'll get as many as we can. Um, I have two brief questions. One, um, Americans in the 1950s were developing ideas of using tactical nuclear weapons, uh, making the use of nuclear weapons thinkable. And I was wondering, this is my first question, whether you came across anything um, that any of Churchill's thoughts on the idea of developing tactical nuclear weapons and actually using them in more limited wars. Second thing is, um, James Carroll, an American writer who wrote about the American military establishment, um, says that the destructiveness of the hydrogen bomb took Churchill uh, back to the, to, the, to the point where he speculates uh, that Churchill would have been encouraging um, not only arms control but disarmament at, at some point rather than just deterrence and strate strategic balance. So do you also see Churchill sentiments towards the end of his life would, going that far uh, to champion you know, disarmament and so on? Go ahead. Um, to deal with your, first, uh, your second question first, yes, I think towards the end of his life, his last great speech in the House of Commons is on the hydrogen bomb. It's in March 1955. He leaves number 10 for the last time just a few weeks later. And he talks about deterrence as the way, he calls it the only sane way to keep peace in the current Cold War world. And as long as nuclear weapons are sheathed, the potential for detente exists. And so in a sort of sequential way, you, you move to detente and then beyond detente. I mean, detente isn't magicking the Cold War out of existence. It's finding a way of managing the Cold War in a way that doesn't blow the earth to pieces. Then you've got to go a little bit backwards. When he retired after 1955, he corresponded, and this I found very interesting, with President Eisenhower, whose views were going in a slightly different way, 55 to 57. And they had a fairly vigorous intellectual exchange in their letters, which are all, can be found in the very archive that's in this, um, in this, in, in, in this great college. Um, and Eisenhower's view was that you, you know, sort of, um, he, he, he writes on one occasion, 
even though Hitler was essentially defeated by late 44, early 45, why did he continue the war that brought even greater destruction upon Germany and also kept the war going for another six months so the Red Army gets deeper into Europe, etc.? You cannot, Winston, in your world of nuclear balance, rule out the madman, the madman act. Churchill is in the south of France having, having dinner at uh, Lord Beaverbrook's house, his old, his old chum, the press baron, and um, they get to talking about all this sort of stuff around the table, and James Lees Milne writes a little diary account of what Churchill said on that occasion. And Churchill said, first of all, he said, uh, he said I, think, um, I think that we're getting very close to destroying the world. And he said, if I was the almighty, I might not remake it again in case they blew me up next time. So you can imagine him rumbling like this. And then he went on to say, I have read On the Beach by Neville Shute, the apocalyptic novel. And he said, I'm thinking of sending a copy to Premier Khrushchev. And one of the dinner guests turned around and said, uh, and President Eisenhower? He said, it would be a waste of money. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've forgotten your first question. I'm going to give that one. Sorry. Technical. Tactical. Tactical, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I have nothing to do. I just wanted to say on that that uh, was, what was sad to me was, uh, well, sorry, first of all, what was interesting is that uh, the, the fascination that Churchill had with uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, matters was, 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 we're not making this up. I mean, after he left office, he, was, he went more than once to Sir John Cockroft's uh, nuclear uh, establishment. He went yeah. just before he, uh, he left office. Mm. He, uh, he went to see movies mm. of, of the nuclear explosions mm. at, at Harwell. He was really fascinated by this. And I might say, uh, every testimony that I've read, he was deeply depressed by it. He really did. Mm. My understanding is that he really did think that we were, yeah. on, a, uh, we, we were on a course that was uh, heading towards <laughs> annihilation, which is, I think, a very sad situation. Because, as I said, I think he felt his own career had been a failure, which, I, as I said, I, I, I know that's a pessimistic view, but I think he suspected uh, uh, that was the case. One thing I tried very, very hard to do right, was to work out whether he really did see Dr. Strangelove or not. I don't <laughs> think he did. Uh, but, he, but, but he did read a lot of nuclear He did, he did, I, but I never could pin that one down. Um, um, yeah. uh, your point uh, about, about the tactical nuclear weapons, yes, they were just coming online, if that's the right term, with NATO, 54, 55, as he was going out. The thing that exercised him was who takes the decision to go nuclear if the Red Army invade. He wanted governance to be the, governments to be the sovereign decision maker. Eisenhower was saying, there won't be time. And, um, he could have had a referendum. He could have had a <laughs> referendum, yeah, yeah. Shall we, shall we? Sorry. In a, and um, he, um, <laughs> he's, he's out of office before he has to deal with that one. But, that, but, that, but that's a question that I suspect is even today exercising nuclear nuclear decision makers. Yeah. Do we have a question from over here? Maybe here in the front. As well as taking scientific advice, when did the question of ethics come into the making of the hydrogen, of the uh, first bomb? And who was both Roosevelt and Churchill taking their advice from and discussing the potential consequences and whether they would or wouldn't go ahead. Can I be? If you, yeah, please. Uh, well, I, if we're talking about Churchill, uh, I don't recall any deep reflection, moral reflection about the thing. I mean, uh, I found in the archive that as soon as he heard this bomb was on the way, he wrote "good" in the margin. Right? Uh, I, I I look very hard to see uh, any comment from. Uh, either Churchill or the other scientists, who I was also looking at really quite closely. And frankly, if asked to describe it uh, in, uh, uh, in general, I would say that the state of terror that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, held scientists, in particular uh, Piles, to whom I actually spoke about this, so uh, that they're someone I did speak to directly, they were so terrified of the prospect of, of Hitler getting that bomb that, uh, that everything else went by the wayside. Right? The Allies, or Britain, or whatever you want to call it, had to have that weapon. That was, that was uh, Piles' view. Right? And, uh, and, I just, and my understanding is that was the view of all of his colleagues. Right? So uh, the, the ethical uh, matters that you... I'm sorry, I sound like I'm mocking them, but I know it's very important. Uh, the, the, uh, this started to be uh, discussed in, uh, in, in detail 
only when the bomb was basically ready. If you look at the, when the Chicago group finished the work on the Manhattan Project early, you had a group set up there that were looking with some sensitivity about this. You had Szilard and what have you, right? But that was not the case among the, uh, among the, uh, among the British scientists, and it was all too late by then. Uh, it was basically going to happen, right? and it did. Yeah, the, 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 the moral and ethical concerns were more prominent from my research amongst the scientific community, and Joseph Rockblatt will walk mm -hmm. out of Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. Once it's clear that the German atomic project is going nowhere, and even more so once Germany is defeated in May 1945, for a lot of people, the original impetus, I think, behind the bomb on, on, on the scientific side is removed, um, and, there's, and, there, and there is disquiet, um, for sure. Churchill said that the decision to use the atomic bomb, the decision, which he maintained was a joint decision between him and President Truman, it wasn't. <laughs> he agreed with Truman's decision, as he was supposed to do under wartime agreements. He said that it was never even an issue. Yeah. And he said that in 1953, in the final volume, Triumph and Tragedy, of his six-volume history. By 1953, the world and his wife knows exactly what these terrible engines of destruction do. And there was an opportunity, if he wanted, for having a little bit of sort of um, moral agonizing. But I, I did look at this in, in, my conclusion was devoted actually to this issue because I kind of hadn't had it and if I felt I had to have this issue. And so it comes at the end. And I did trace it quite carefully. And I think his view remained remarkably consistent. And mm. Churchill is not remarkably consistent mm. on an awful lot of things. <laughs> yeah. His view was that in war, weapons get used. This was just another weapon that, after its use and later on, lots of people began to see it as a different weapon. But at the time, it was just another weapon. He would also go on not quite so many words as to, as to ask in moral terms, does it make a difference whether you kill... X number of people with one bomb or with like the bombing of Tokyo in March, conventional bombing of Tokyo on the 12th, 13th of March, 1945, Operation Meeting House, 100,000 dead, but it was, it was, it was about it was hundreds and hundreds of aircraft, thousands and thousands mm. of tons of high explosives. Uh, General Curtis E. LeMay was very proud of what had happened at, at Tokyo and he claimed that it was a greater level of destruction than, than, than the atomic bombs meted out. Um, Churchill's view was that, you know, sort of, if a moral line had been crossed, it had been crossed long before the atomic bombs came into the world. Yeah. And I think if he ever went deeply enough, he'd say the really, you know, sort of uh, the atom, as, as Lewis Strauss once said, you know, the atom is not moral or immoral or amoral. It's, it's man that, 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 that brings that to it. I think, I, think, I think his view was fairly straightforward. It's a weapon, and from the day that it was launched in '41 there was what a very eminent American historian called Barton Bernstein calls a presumption of use. Yes. And so whether he should have had a greater moral conscience about it is a, is a different speculative discussion. If you ask, did he have one? I don't think he did. But he was troubled in later life by the apocalyptic proportions these weapons had taken, and he does become a conviction-driven disciple of detente, but not for any, to my mind, morally-driven reasons. I just had a, 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 a foot, very just quick, yeah. very footnote, uh, quick footnote. I look quite hard, actually, uh, at uh, any scientists who act, uh, who resisted working on a potentially destructive weapon. To the best of my knowledge, there's only one, right, and that's Lisa Meitner, mm -hmm. who I believe refused to work on nuclear weapons. One claim to. That was Max Bourne, the theoretical physicist who got tenure up in uh, Edinburgh. But I was quite interested there because I found a letter in the archive of the Imperial War Museum where he was egging them on in 19, uh, in, uh, um, uh, at the time. So uh, that, 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 I'm afraid, is not defensible. But I'd be interested to know if anybody knows of any other instances on that, but that's all I know. So there are many more questions in the audience. I'm afraid that we're out of time for the evening. Oh. All I can say is that I hope um, very much that um, you find the answers to your questions in the comprehensive books that Graham and Kevin have written and which are on sale here tonight, so I encourage you to, to take a look. Um, it would be hard, I think, to summarize kind of gracefully and, and succinctly such a, a wide-ranging discussion, so I'm not going to attempt to do that. 
However, I think before we thank Kevin and Graham, um, before you have a chance to chat with them uh, or to pick up their books outside, I do want to offer, by way of conclusion to this evening's event, just an insight and a question that I had as I read through uh, their books and, their, and, and, and grappled with their studies of, of Churchill and nuclear warfare. So the insight for me, uh, or one of the many, um, but one of the, the ones that feels quite important right now, was a powerful reminder about just how much it matters who's in positions of power when there are important decisions that need to be made. Uh, and even more so how much, I don't- When did you write this? Yeah, <laughs> even more so how much it matters who the advisors and who the confidants of those in power are when decisions involve matters that are too technical or too uncertain for everyday reasoning to be of use. That is a powerful message that comes away uh, from your books. And the question I have relates to an aspect of these histories that I think one really can't help but notice. Um, and it's, of course, an aspect that no historian, however talented, um, would ever be able to get around. Uh, the story of atomic weapons in hot war and in cold war is a story about men. It is a story about men of science and men of government and men of the military. Uh, and it is therefore a story that I think can make one wonder, would it have been different if women had not been denied access to these worlds in such systematic ways? Would it have been different if there had been women physicists uh, to take part in the... <laughs> Yes, there are women in this story, but they're not at the, the, the sort of top features. Thank you. Um, but would it have been different if there had been more physicists at the top of their fields, um, people like Lise Meitner, um, to take part in the early experimentation that led physicists to propose bomb making to their governments? Would it have been different if there had been more women in parliament when the H-bomb was debated? Would it have been different if the president of the United States were a woman? We shall never know. Kevin, Graham, thank you for writing your thought-provoking, your sure-to-be-enduring accounts of this history. And thank you so much for sharing your, your work here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.